What is the greatest objection against Christianity? Maybe I should say, what is the strongest challenge to the biblical worldview and the Christian faith? While I was studying for my philosophy of religion masters at Trinity, and just through the various circumstances that my family and I have gone through over the years, I've significantly wrestled with this question. What is the toughest objection to the, the truth of Christianity and the biblical worldview? And I've come to decide and realize that both for me and for the people that I interact with and talk with on a daily basis, the strongest objection, if there is one, to the truth of the Christian message is the problem of evil. In other words, why does a good God allow so much evil in the world? That's what we're going to be talking about in this episode. I hope by the end of it, not only will it have made you think, but you'll be better equipped to answer this challenge from a biblical perspective in a way that is confident, in a way that you can lead your family in it and take them along for this journey as well. How should Christians address the problem of evil? How do we answer the challenge that a good God who is all-knowing and perfectly loving would allow evil in the world? Okay, so let's go ahead and jump right in. If the Lord is good, why does he allow evil? Or we might say, since we're believers, since the Lord is good, why does he allow evil? A non-Christian would say, if God is good, or if God exists. What we're going to talk about is why God allows evil. We are going to answer that question. And again, I think this is the most challenging objection to the Christian message. We're also going to learn two bad ways of answering this question that actually don't work. I don't think that they work at all. I don't think you should ever use these two ways, although they're very popular. And then we're going to talk about three solid answers to this question, one of which is most important, and I think that you need to use it all the time. The other two are more personal, and one in particular is going to be deeply personal. The other one I think is really good for those within the church to speak about with each other, might not be as convincing for a non-Christian. Okay, so if you're watching, if you're listening, thank you for coming along on this journey. Let's get into it. How should Christians address the problem of evil? All right, let's start by just hitting this objection head on. The non-Christian who makes this challenge towards Christianity, they're assuming something. Do you know what they're assuming? What is the non-Christian assuming when he or she accuses God of allowing evil and saying that's wrong to do? Well, this person is assuming that evil is a meaningful concept. But what is evil? Philosophers and theologians and thinkers have wrestled with the question of what evil is for millennia, literally. And at best, what we can figure out, what we can understand is that evil is a deprivation of good. I like to think of evil as a corruption of the good. It's either a, a deprivation, meaning it's a lack of goodness when goodness ought to be there, or it's a taking and turning and twisting of goodness and turning it into something else. That's why evil sometimes looks like Sauron up in his tower sending orcs out to conquer Middle Earth, and other times it looks like a movie that seems to have a good message, but that's just a little bit twisted, a little bit corrupted. And you're watching the movie and you go, that sounds right. The terms that they're using are the right terms, but there's something off here. This movie is turning us in a direction other than towards what is good. That would be more of a corruptive view of evil. But either way, however you define evil, for evil to be a meaningful concept, evil relies on goodness. There must be a coherent, clear explanation of what goodness is if evil is going to make any sense at all. If there's no such thing as goodness, objectively, then it doesn't make any sense to talk about evil. And it doesn't make any sense to talk about God allowing evil, number one, because what is evil? And number two, it doesn't make any sense to try and hold God accountable, quote unquote, I'm using air quotes here, for allowing evil. After all, 
why would it be wrong for God to allow evil? Now, I, I, hear me. I'm not saying that it's that evil is good or anything like that. What I'm saying is, for the skeptic, for the atheist, for the non-Christian, to say that it's wrong for God to allow evil, why would that be? Why? What standard is the atheist or non-Christian appealing to? Number one, for to say that it's wrong for God to do this, and number two, what is the atheists or skeptics? absolute standard of goodness by which we could even judge what's good or evil, let alone judge whether or not God is doing something good or evil. So these are the questions that we can ask as we're seeking to clarify this position. And once we do, once we start asking the unbeliever, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by good? What do you mean by evil? What we're going to do is we're going to clarify the position down, and we're going to discover that the unbeliever is basically making this accusation. Christianity is false because the idea that God is all good and all knowing and all powerful, and yet he allows evil, that doesn't make sense. That confluence of ideas, that worldview is incoherent. Because what the unbeliever will say is, God must not be good because a good God would want to stop evil if he could. Or God must not be all knowing because an all-knowing God would know all the instances of evil and he would stop them. Or God must not be all-powerful because an all-powerful God would be able to stop evil. In other words, the skeptic or the non-Christian, and if you're watching this and, and you're a skeptic, you're a non-Christian, and you've made this accusation, this is essentially what you're saying, isn't it? Uh, you're challenging the Christian to defend the idea that a God who is perfectly good, all-knowing, and all-powerful is also the same God that would allow evil. And what you're saying is that such a God must not exist, could not exist. All right. But you probably know where I'm going to really drill down. And that is, if you take God out of the equation, on what basis? You have no basis for thinking of evil as a coherent concept. Because God, by definition, is the absolute um, all-powerful, all-knowing, totally authoritative source of goodness, and he is the one who reveals goodness to us. We're going to talk more about that when we talk about the Christian worldview, but right now we're just unpacking the skeptical position, where the skeptic or the non-Christian is coming from. But the skeptic or the non-Christian, whether you're a materialist, an atheist, whether you belong to another religion, by taking the triune God of Scripture out of the picture, you have lost that absolute, knowable, unchanging standard of goodness. And th therefore, you don't have that standard, and therefore you can't use that standard to try and contradict the God of the Bible. The skeptic can tell you that he experiences evil in the world, and yes, that is true, we all do experience evil, but Given his own fundamental beliefs, his own presuppositions, he cannot tell you why those things are evil, or even that they are evil. So bear in mind, the whole challenge here is that God should not have allowed evil in the world, but our non-Christian cannot even define evil or cannot appeal to an absolute standard with which to judge God for being supposedly evil or being wrong for allowing evil. Now, again, the non-Christian is going to say, I experience evil. I, I don't need God to know what evil is. That really begs the question, because the fact that he knows what evil is actually indicates that he does know God. And Romans chapter 1 says that men know God but suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And I like to think about this phenomenon of truth suppression as a man standing chest high in a swimming pool that is filled with ping pong balls. And those ping pong balls represent facts about God. And what the man is doing, the sinner is doing, and believe me, I'm there right with you, atheists. If not for the grace of God, I'm there with you. But they take all the ping pong balls and they try to push them under the surface of the water. But you can only hold down so many ping pong balls. What, 50, 100 maybe on a good day? As you're holding these down, what's going to happen? One or two of those ping pong balls are going to come flying back up to the surface, and they're going to become, these are facts about God's nature and the way he created the world. Those are going to pop up out of the water, and you're going to hyper-focus on that one. That's what the atheist or the skeptic or the non-Christian is doing. He's pushing down, trying to suppress 
all of these facts about God and the way he made the world and nature, human nature. But in the process, this little fact about goodness is popping up out of the water and he's hyper-focusing on that. And he's trying, he has to explain that away because those ping pong balls are supposed to be held down subliminally below the surface of our awareness. So the fact that one has popped up, that's a major problem for the skeptic or the atheist. And he looks at it and he has to explain it. So he says, aha, it's not my fault. It's God's fault that I'm hyper-focusing on this goodness and this standard of good and evil. It's God's fault. God should not have allowed evil in the world. And that's really what's going on here with this truth suppression. The facts about God have not changed, but because we are by nature sinners, we don't want God to exist. We want to be captains of our own soul. We want to be autonomous in our reasoning and in our thinking. Romans 1 addresses this. It says, claiming to be wise, we became fools. That's what's going on. Fool or folly, that is a moral term. It means that the eyes of your heart, your mind, have been darkened because you've denied God. Proverbs says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Again, that's a moral a moral condition that has intellectual ramifications. So the non-Christian position is actually absurd. Take God out of the picture, and there is no standard of goodness. There is no standard of goodness, which means there's therefore no standard of evil, which means the idea that God is wrong for allowing evil in the world is totally nonsensical, because what is evil, what is goodness, and why is it a problem to allow evil in the world? So at this point, the atheist is is wanting to turn the tables and say, yeah, but it's still an incoherent concept to say that God, who is all good, all knowing, et cetera, et cetera, all powerful, would allow evil in the world. So now what we're going to do is this. We're going to invite the non-Christian into our worldview for the sake of argument, and we're going to do an internal critique of the Christian worldview. What we're going to do is we're going to show that the walls are solid. They can support the house. We're going to look at the basement. We're going to look at the foundation. We're going to say, this foundation is solid. But before we can show that, we have to show that we're standing in the right house. We have to show that the walls, if you will, are actually our walls. What we have to do first is we have to address two bad arguments, two faulty explanations as to why God allows evil in the world. We're going to address those first, and then we're going to get into the really the correct answer. Okay, so first let's start by looking at the first bad explanation, and that's this, to say that evil is not really evil at all. That is a bad explanation. To do this is to redefine what the Bible actually says. It's to actually contradict the Bible, and it's actually to disobey Scripture in its entirety, directly. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Look, evil really is evil. We're Christians. We can deal with good and evil. It's all throughout the Bible. So we can't just say, no, you don't understand. God allows evil, but it's not really evil. It's just our perception of evil. Evil's not really that bad. It's actually good. No. As followers of the Lord, we recognize that evil does exist. It is real. And we do have to deal with that fact. We do. It's unavoidable. As Christians, we shouldn't seek to avoid it. All right. So that's the first bad explanation. The second bad explanation is one that you have heard. It's one that you have seen in movies like God's Not Dead. And that's this the free will defense. The free will defense, I know this is going to be controversial, especially if you love the free will defense. You're not going to like what I have to say, but please keep an open mind. Hear me on this because the free will defense is not a good argument answering the problem of evil. Here's what it says. It says that God's highest priority is that his creatures, especially moral creatures like human beings and angels, have free will. God's highest priority is that we have free will. This means that God has to allow evil. It's not that he wanted there to be evil necessarily, but in order to give people free will, he had to allow the possibility of evil, and therefore the 
arrival of evil and the emergence of evil into the world is really just out of God's control. Or it's within his control, but because his highest priority is our free will, he couldn't stop evil from coming into the world. To do so, he would have had to eliminate free will. And at first, you listen to this and you say, that actually makes sense. Because God needs us to have free will so that we can love him freely. After all, love that is not free, love that is coerced, that's not really love. But listen, what this the reason why this is bad is, number one, it's not what the Bible teaches. Number two, according to this view, the free will defense, evil and suffering have no actual purpose. They only exist because God had to allow them in order to bring about free will. Free will is our is God's greatest priority, and it's ultimately about us being in control and really us being sovereign. This is a man-centered explanation. And again, the Bible does not teach it. Human beings, angels can even sin. In the Bible, it talks about angels who have sinned. But God's highest priority is not our sovereignty. God's highest priority is not that man is Lord of his own destiny. Rather, the Bible is replete, full of teachings that God is Lord, that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible is about the Lordship of God and His glory. So if you look up Isaiah 48, 9 through 11, here's what it says. Isaiah 48, 9 through 11 says, For my own name's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you, so as not to destroy you completely. See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. This passage talks about how God is allowing his people to go through the furnace of affliction, the suffering and evil that we experience in this world, not to promote our own free will or the free will of angels. God couldn't stop the devil from doing things, so he had just had to allow it. No. God does these things for his own sake, for his own glory. God is about God. God is about his glory, his goodness. And does that mean that God is an egomaniac? No, absolutely not. We're going to see why that's not the case in just a minute, so hang with me. But God is about God because God is the highest possible goal. God's glory is the apotheosis of all existence. So for God to pursue, that's not a problem. That's a good thing. You wouldn't want God to have his greatest focus to be on something less than God. That's actually idolatry. Putting your highest and greatest and deepest affections and glory on anything less than God is idolatry. God's not an idolater. God is about God. So all that to say, the free will defense is a bad explanation. Again, controversial. Maybe you disagree with that. Maybe you agree with it. But Let me know in the comments, and I I will respond to that at the end. Now, before we go any further, I have to let you know this. If you are a Christian man looking to lead your family in the biblical worldview and become better able to defend your faith and answer all the world's questions about the truth of the Christian message, you need to know about the Hammer and Anvil Society. The Hammer and Anvil Society is our elite men's learning fellowship. It's just for men, just for Christian men. And right now you have several different courses to choose from that are going to help you take your learning further and build your knowledge base. But it's not just about the knowledge, it's about brotherhood and fellowship and practical application. And that's what you're going to get through accountability, weekly cohort calls, readings, and lectures that are designed to help you articulate, share, and defend your faith. If you want to learn more about this, go to thethink.institute slash society. Again, that's thethink.institute slash society. T-H-E think.institute slash society. Okay, now let's talk about the correct answer, the right answer to the Christian or to the, the problem of evil. There we go. Transitioning out of ad mode and getting back into apologetics mode. First of all, we have to address the big gaping hole that was in the atheistic or non-Christian worldview that the Christian worldview doesn't have. 
And that is this, an absolute standard of goodness. In order for the problem of evil to really be a problem, there has to be an absolute standard of goodness. Is there an absolute standard of goodness in the Christian worldview? Yes, of course there is. That absolute standard of goodness is God himself. In fact, God is so good, he is so unique in his goodness, that only God is good. So when a man came up to Jesus and said, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? What was Jesus' response? He said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. In other words, my friend, if you're calling me good, you better be prepared to call me God as well. I can't be good if I'm not God. So what that means is that, biblically speaking, God is good, and everything that God does is good, and everything that is good in creation is of God. Christianity does not have this big gaping hole of not having an absolute standard. Christianity has a standard, but that just means that we can talk about good and evil. We haven't solved the problem yet of why God actually allows it. And so here it is, and I'm going to give this to you, and maybe you're going to like it, and maybe you're not, but it's true and it's biblical. And the, the reason why God allows evil in the world is this. He has a morally sufficient reason for doing so. God has a morally sufficient reason for allowing evil in the world. Morally sufficient is another way of saying right enough or good enough. God does have reasons that we can see explained in Scripture, played out in our own lives, but we're only in this life going to see a part of what God is doing. We are not God, and we are not capable of understanding all the intricate elements that God has woven together in this incredible tapestry of existence. We are creatures. He is creator. The Bible says that he is the potter and we are the clay. And actually, when the Bible gives that metaphor of being clay and God is the potter, that's actually found in Romans chapter 9. In that passage, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, but who are you, O man, to answer to God, to answer back to God? In other words, when our hearts rise up and we say, how dare you, God? How dare you allow evil in the world? Scripture is staring us back in the face and saying, who are you, a mere man, to answer back to God? Are you going to challenge the Almighty? You are clay. You are a vessel that God has created, and He is capable of forming you into anything that He wants, and He's capable of doing whatever He wants with you as a vessel. Another name for this defense or this argument, I love this. It's called the shut-up defense. As in, shut up, he explained. And you say, well, that doesn't sound very kind. That doesn't sound very loving. Well, how kind and loving is it to challenge Almighty God, the Almighty God who is perfectly holy, perfectly sovereign. He is Lord of all. And not only that, but He is your Creator. I once asked an atheist, can a pot answer back to the potter and say, why did you make me like this? Really asking the same question that Paul asks there in Romans. And the atheist responded by saying, well, yeah, if the pot was sentient and had a mind like ours, yeah, the pot should be able to challenge the potter. But here's the thing. What that's doing is that's changing one aspect of that metaphor and not changing the other. So now the pot has feelings and a mind, right? In other words, we're greater than a pot. But what the atheist never says is that not only are we greater than a pot, but God is so much more infinitely greater than a mere potter. So if you're going to elevate the pot, elevate the potter as well. If you're going to say, well, the pot is sentient, the pot is a moral being, the pot is a person, well, God is not just a human potter. God is the almighty creator of all the world, the Lord of heaven and earth. He is so much more supreme and superior than any mere potter that the metaphor still holds. In fact, the metaphor is even intensified. Who are we, mere creatures, to answer back to our creator? In other words, you can't challenge God. 
How dare you challenge God? How dare I shake my fist at God? Shut up, Scripture says to me. And we can't respond back to that. The only proper response is to close our mouths and say, like Job says in the book of Job, I repent in dust and ashes. Who are we to answer back to God? And we could just leave things right there. God has a morally sufficient reason for everything that he allows, and that doesn't really make my heart feel any better, but God doesn't just leave us there. There's another answer in Scripture, and we call this the greater good defense. The greater good defense. Now, one thing we have to recognize is that creation is subjected to evil, yes, but we ourselves are evil. This is why the shut-up defense is so effective, because we are sinners. Uh, the Bible says that from Adam on down, we have been sinners. Romans 5 talks about that. Genesis 3.17 says that the ground is cursed because of the man's sin. So uh, the world is cursed because of human sin, but we ourselves are also sinners. We are evil. Apart from God and his grace, apart from God remaking us, we ourselves are evil. So when we're looking out at the world, we have to look back at our own hearts and say, why is God allowed evil in my own heart? And what's God going to do about it? What is God going to do about this evil that's in the world and this evil that's in my heart? And the amazing thing is that God's plan is not to leave evil victorious in the world. God is potter, we are clay, the world is clay, and God knows what he's doing with his clay. And so the second defense, we call this the greater good defense. And I think this is actually a great explanation because I think it's a biblical one. God brings good out of evil, and God brings greater good out of evil than the evil detracts from. So evil is a corruption or a deprivation of good. But God uses evil to bring more good into the world than the evil detracts, than the evil takes away from the world. We can trust God to work all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Maybe you recognize that verse. That's Romans 8.28. This is the greater good defense. And notice it doesn't just say that God is going to work all things out for you. He says he's going to use, he's going to work all things together for good. So things that are in this world that are good and things that are bad and everything in between, if there is anything in between, God is working them together into this amazing tapestry that in the end will produce and even now is producing greater good. And we see this all throughout scripture, don't we? You see in the first book of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 50, Joseph, the son of Jacob, or the son of Israel, Jacob and Israel is the same person. Joseph is talking to his brothers who have sold him into slavery, abandoned him for dead. And Joseph has now been elevated to the number two position in all of Egypt. And he's looking down on his brothers and they are cowering in fear, rightly. And they're essentially pleading with him, look, please do not get revenge on us. And Joseph, just big-hearted, magnanimously, he says, harm you. I'm paraphrasing. Harm you. How could I possibly harm you? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. It doesn't say God used for good. God meant it for good. In other words, God intended the evil actions of Joseph's brothers to happen so that greater good would result. And that's an, incredible, that's an amazing truth. The story of Joseph and his brothers actually has a happy ending. It's really, it's true. But we see the same thing happen in the New Testament as well. So let me ask you this. What was the greatest evil that ever occurred in all of human history? The worst thing that's ever happened. The worst thing that's ever happened in all of human history is the sham trial, torture, and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Why was that the greatest evil? Because Jesus is the one innocent man who's ever lived. Because Jesus is the creator, the good creator, come down in human form. 
God came down in all of his purity and goodness and light and love and compassion, and we killed him. And we did it under the pretense of supposed justice. It, it was just everything. It was upside down clown world when Jesus got crucified. The worst evil that ever happened when Jesus was crucified. But here's how Peter explains it to the Judeans in Acts chapter 2, verse 23. It says, this Jesus delivered up to the definite and for, definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. In other words, God had a plan. It was a perfect and flawless plan, and he used evil men to do it. They didn't know that they were accomplishing the salvation of humanity when they were crucifying Jesus, but God knew. And God used that very evil act, the worst act in history. Actually, it was carried out by Satan himself because Satan entered into Judas who betrayed Jesus. And that got the whole ball rolling with Jesus's crucifixion. So God used that evil and turned it inside out and turned it good. They didn't know they were doing it, but God knew and God worked it into his plan. So this is the greater good defense. You can be absolutely certain that all the evil in the world, including the evil of denying God, even the evil acts that you have committed in your life, God is working even those together for good. That doesn't mean it wasn't evil. Remember, we don't call evil things good, but we recognize that God is perfectly good and he's so good and so all-powerful and so all-knowing and all-loving that God has already worked your evil and mine into his plan. Thank God. Okay, so now we say, fine. I understand my position before God, and I'm hopefully looking forward to the day when God makes all things new. As we read about in Romans 8, we're eagerly awaiting, creation is eagerly awaiting the redemption of the revealing of the sons of God, us, the children of God. But what do I do in the here and now? How do I handle the evil and the trauma and the pain of existence now in this life? This brings us to the third defense, and this is called the soul-building defense. And again, I think this is a good one. The soul-building defense says that God uses evil to bring us closer to himself. Now, we were created to know God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that eternal life itself is to know God. When Adam was created, he used to walk with God in the garden. That's the status of humanity in our original creation. But living in this fallen world, being sinners ourselves, our relationship with God has been severed and broken. Not only are we subject to evil outside of us, but we commit evil inside, in our hearts, in our lives. But the Holy Spirit, when he comes and makes us believers, he gives us a new heart. Ezekiel eleven nineteen and 36, 26 talks about how God is going to give us a new heart. Take away our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. He is the comforter, the advocate. He gives us the ability to persevere through trials and through tribulations, and he even allows us to have joy in the midst of pain. This is what God does. He, he dwells with us. So in John 14, 17, Jesus says this, he is the spirit of truth, the world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. In John 16, 7, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. How does Jesus give us that peace? He gives us that peace by dwelling in us and with us by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comforts us, even in our affliction. And as the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 13, 5, we don't have to fear anything because we can trust God never to leave us and never to forsake us. In Psalm 119, verse 71, David just says this. He says, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. 
David credits his suffering with teaching him obedience, teaching him the right way to live. In our original created state, we didn't need help to follow God, but now we're sinners. We need help. We need discipline. And one of the ways that God disciplines us and trains us is through suffering and even by allowing evil in the world. It's no fun when you go to the gym and you're pumping iron. It, it is fun because you know what's going to result from it. But man, that next day after you hit the gym and maybe you didn't take your post-workout, you didn't go to the sauna afterwards, and your muscles are just filled with that malic acid, it's good pain because your muscles have been broken down. They've been torn so that they will grow back even stronger. It's the same way in the Christian life. So Job in Job 42, 5 says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Can you see how Job expresses from his heart that his suffering has led him to a greater relationship with God, a greater obedience and knowledge of God? 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 says this, In him you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says that your destiny is glory, and it's glorious. Jesus Christ is glorious. God is glorious. The Holy Spirit is glorious. But your destiny as a Christian is to partake in the glorious reality of heaven, of God, of knowing God, and being with God forever. And God is actually preparing you for an eternal weight of glory even now that is infinitely precious, infinitely valuable, and that's going to make all the evil and suffering that you experienced and evil and suffering that you witnessed in your life pale in comparison. If you want a really good depiction of what this is or what this might be like, check out C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. In that, and I won't spoil it for you, but in that you see the solidity and the greatness of goodness that God has prepared for us, all this evil that happens in the world. It is really and truly evil, and the Bible does not downplay it, but compared to the goodness and glory that God has prepared, there's just no comparison. The evil is almost non-existent in comparison. And I don't wanna, again, I don't wanna downplay evil, but that is the picture that scripture gives us. And that's the picture that you'll see in The Great Divorce. So I hope that this was helpful. I hope that you've seen that the idea that God is all-knowing, all perfectly good, all powerful, is absolutely not inconsistent with the existence of evil in the world. This is the toughest objection, at least now, to the existence of God. But it turns out, not to be a very good objection at all. Without God, you can't make sense of good and evil. With God, you don't always understand everything, but good and evil make sense, and you are reassured that God is totally good, loves us, and is doing what is best for us. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. This has been a production of the Think Institute. We are a Christian teaching and evangelistic organization aimed at helping you, the Christian man, to articulate, share, and defend your faith and to lead your family in the biblical worldview so that together, you, your wife, and your kids will be able to answer every question about the truth of the Christian message. I'm Joel Sedekase, and until next time, I hope it made you think.